Hi, this is Raj Mehta, and this is going to be a brief video introduction to antibiotic selection. The main points I'm going to be going over in this video lecture is your strategy to selecting antibiotics, a brief review of different classes and common pathogens, uh, and finally, uh, we're just going to go over resources you can use to implement your antibiotic strategy so, and uh, to choose which antibiotic class you want to target uh, against which pathogens. Now, antibiotic selection can be a very challenging topic because there is such a large, overwhelming volume of knowledge to master. And the point of this guide is that if you have a systematic approach toward antibiotic selection, you can make use of evidence-based resources like the John Hopkins Antibiotic Guide or the Stanford Guide to guide you through this process and make this much easier for yourself. Just as a note, if you don't have either one of these options, I would recommend you get it, whether you get it in a book form or you get them as an app. However you can get it, most educational institutions should be able to subscribe to them or get them uh, for relatively low cost or for free. Okay, let's begin by reviewing our strategy for selecting antibiotics. The first and most important thing we have to know in our strategy is, number one, do we have a bacterial infection? Obviously, our antibiotics are not going to be very helpful if we misdiagnose a person or if a person is, in fact, not suffering from a bacterial infection. And there's a lot of clinical signs and clues you look for to help you confirm this. Do they have elevated white blood cell count? Are they having excess neutrophils? Are they having fevers, etc.? Uh, keep in mind that most infections are viral, and so if you have an individual for whom you're unsure, it's worth doing some investigation before you jump to and use antibiotics inappropriately. And again, this is important because we don't want to increase the amount of resistance we create in our communities from inappropriate use of antibiotics. But once we have confirmed that, yes, indeed, we have a high suspicion of a bacterial infection, we have to go to step number two in uh, going through our systematic method, and that's to determine what the most likely pathogen causing our infection this is important because we need to know our likely pathogen in order to choose an evidence-based and empiric source uh, of antibiotics to treat and attack that pathogen. And it's important to, to do this uh, both for your anatomical site and for your setting. What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is that if you have an infection in the lungs, then you're uh, going to look for what are the most common pathogens that can cause lung infections. Uh, and if that lung infection is someone who picked it up in the community, like a community-acquired pneumonia, you're going to have a different set of pathogens than someone who's in a hospital-acquired pneumonia. And again, uh, any antibiotic guide you use can help you uh, determine the most likely pathogen. If you don't know this, you can just use your reference to look it up. But it's, it's very important that after you've determined you have a bacterial infection, to number two, determine where that infection is and what are the most likely pathogens causing that infection. Okay, now we can go to step number three. So, before we pick an antibiotic, we have to know our local sensitivities. And the reason is that once we determine what our most likely pathogen is, it's important to know if that particular pathogen or group of pathogens are resistant to certain antibiotics in your community. And this will vary in different settings. The way you can know this is by looking up your local antibiogram. Every hospital or community setting should usually have an antibiogram that can just go through usually annually at the very least, uh, what are the common resistance patterns to different drugs. So for example, if MRSA is very common in your community, uh, but it has a high sensitivity clindamycin, then you can use clindamycin to treat MRSA. If on the other hand, your community antibiogram suggests that you have a large amount of resistance to clindamycin for MRSA, you know it's probably not a good idea to use that for empiric treatment of a suspected MRSA infection. Okay, so let's say you're somewhat familiar with your local sensitivities, and we know our likely pathogen based on our anatomical site. The next step in our process is to inquire for our specific patient, number four, if they've been on previous antibiotics, and then number five, specific host factors or factors relevant to that patient. So previous antibiotic regimen is important because if they've been on previous antibiotics, you want to avoid using those antibiotics because maybe the patient has a pathogen resistant to it, uh, or if they've had previous blood cultures or cultures of any kind, they can help you target your antibiotic choice because you know that, hey, based on previous infections the patient's had, we know their resistance to this class of drugs and their sensitivities to another class of drugs. So it can just kind of help you uh, pick the antibiotic you want to choose if you have multiple options available. 
Uh, also very important about your specific patient is knowing your host factors. If you have an elderly patient, if you have a patient who's immunocompromised, if you have a patient that's very severely ill, this can change your choice of antibiotics. Immunocompromised patients may have more opportunistic infections, and so you may feel like you have to do a sort of slightly different coverage of different pathogens. If a patient's severely ill, you may feel like you want to do more broad coverage to cover a greater spectrum of pathogens, etc. So you want to take this into account as well. So after you've got through our five, first five steps, the sixth step, which is pretty, uh, I think, self-evident, but is worth pointing out, is that you want to pick a regimen of drugs that uses the fewest drugs possible. Uh, we use antibiotics to help people, but all drugs have side effects, they have complications, they can interact with each other, and if possible, if you have multiple options, you want to go with the option that lets you pick the fewest number of drugs. And finally, and perhaps the most important aspect of our strategy, so I'm going to put a star here, you want to narrow your spectrum within three days. What this means is that our strategy of antibiotic selection is really an empiric guess. We know we have an infection, we know where the site might be, we know the most likely pathogen, we know our local sensitivities, and we're going to pick an antibiotic because we are guessing this will be best and tempted to target our pathogen. However, if we can get some cultures, if we can find out what exactly that pathogen is, we want to try and narrow our antibiotic use and pick an antibiotic that just specifically targets that one pathogen or that particular infection rather than using a lot of broad infect, uh, broad antibiotics. And this is very important because if you narrow within three days, you can reduce your risk of developing drug resistance. And this is what we're really trying to fight here. It's okay to go with large broad spectrum antibiotics if you don't know what's going on to take care of your patient. But you want to, within your three-day period, try to identify your organism and try to narrow from your broad to a more specific antibiotic class. And this is why it's always important to get cultures before you start antibiotics, whether it's blood, whether it's urine, whether it's wound, wherever you're getting them from, you really, really want to identify your culture. And it's very important to get those cultures so you can narrow within that three-day window and reduce your risk of developing unnecessary drug resistance. While we're discussing strategy, it's worth going over a couple key points about antibiotics. Whenever you're prescribing antibiotics, it's always worth asking, one, do you know how your antibiotic actually works? It's good to know. Number two, does your drug have any toxicities and should it be monitored? For example, vancomycin can become toxic if it's too highly dosed, and we often do vanc troughs to monitor the dosing. Number three, dosing and metabolism of drugs. Obviously, you need to know how the do drug is supposed to be dosed in order to give it to your patient. And metabolism is important because, for example, if your drug is renal excreted and you have a patient in renal failure, you may need to adjust your dosing. So it's important to know if your drug is hepatically or renally uh, metabolized. And if so, to make sure if your patient has impairment in either one of those, that you adjust your dose uh, accordingly. And finally, also very important is your cost of the drug. It doesn't help much to give a patient a very expensive drug they can't afford because they're not going to be taking it and it's not going to do them much good. Okay, now that we reviewed strategy briefly, I'm going to go over, again very shortly, your class of antibiotics and common pathogens. Here is a lovely picture that I think does a fairly good job representing your most common class of antibiotics. Uh, normally, when we think of antibiotics, we think of the common organisms they affect and usually uh, the two categories we think of are gram-positive or gram-negative organisms. So uh, the most common and well-known antibiotics, of course, are your beta-lactams, which include penicillins, that are, which are right here, uh, cephalosporins, right here, and then your carbapenems and your monopenems. And those uh, have excellent activities against gram-positives. Um, it's not written here, but I'm just going to make note, your penicillins are basically broken up into four classes. You have your natural penicillins, which is like penicillin G. Then you have your amino penicillins, which is like amoxicillin. And those are created because they're orally absorbable and you can take them orally. Then you have your anti-staph antibiotics, also known as your penicillin ACE resistant antibiotics. And this is like oxicillin, which have excellent staph coverage. And finally, you have your anti-pseudomonal penicillins. Um, also known as your carboxy or urido penicillins, and those are like zosin or tementin that are really good against uh, pseudomonas in addition to other gram positives and gram negatives. Your cephalosporins, your cousins to your penicillins that have about a 10% cross reactivity if you have allergies, go from first generation all the way to the newest fifth generation. The most common you're going to really use are first to third. First generation, Keflex or Ancef have great. Uh, gram-positive coverage. I'm going to put gram-positive here. 
And as you go from first to third, you increase gram-negative coverage. So by the time you get to third generations like ceftriaxone, you have really good gram-negative coverage. Um, the ceftriaxone is really helpful as a third generation because it does cross a blood-brain barrier unlike the, unlike the first generation, so it's very helpful against treating things like meningitis. Other common antibiotics you guys should all be familiar with are your fluoroquinolones, uh, of which levofloxacin is probably one of the most common used for its excellent pulmonary penetration. Your sulfonamides, uh, trimethazim, sulfamethoxidol, which works against folic uh, acid uh, metabolism. You want to know your macrolides, your zithromycins. You want to know clindamycin, which is often very commonly used. Your metronidazole, which is basically flagyl, uh, you use very often. The aminoglycosides, one of the most common early antibiotics, not used as much due to their uh, high toxicity val value, but often used in certain settings. And then uh, not mentioned here on this graph, obviously, is also vancomycin, which is a very important drug given the prevalence of MRSA uh, infections. As it's outlined here, uh, gram-positive penicillins, macrolides, clindamycin is very good against it. Aminoglycosides are specifically good against gram-negatives. And uh, your fluoroquinolones, your, your sulfonamides, your carbapenems, they're all great for both gram-positive and gram-negatives. And your cephalosporins, especially your third generation, are good against both. And then flagell down here, we should probably give it its own category because that's excellent against anaerobic. Next, we'll move on to pathogens. So our pathogens, our bacterial pathogens, can be roughly broken up into your gram negatives or your gram positives. And the reason this is done is when you do a gram stain, uh, they can come back negative or positive, and that's how you classify your bacteria. I think it's worth uh, knowing roughly uh, what the common organisms are for gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So whether you start uh, and you learn this pretty comprehensive chart you see here, or you open up a a microbiology textbook, I think it's really worth becoming familiar with it. And when you select most antibiotics, usually we think of selecting against gram negatives, gram positives, or really anaerobic. Those are the three big things we often think about are we covering for those things. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, uh, which happens a lot, is when we're doing staining, a lot of times we'll get uh, gram positive cocci, and you have staph and strep, which are the two more common categories. And if you start seeing a uh, stains which come back showing lots of clusters, uh, that's a suggestion that it's probably going to grow out staph if you see that stain early on. And if you see more chains or you see pairs of cocci, that suggests it's more likely to be strep. So it's something important to keep in mind when you're looking at your stain before your culture results finally come back. Now I'm briefly going to put everything I've showed you into practice using